Hi, I'm Sharad Kutton and welcome to Let's Talk, the show that brings you the most important conversations in art, culture and ideas. I'm here at the Tinta Budi Bookstore at the Chongsan Building in Kampung Atap, Kuala Lumpur, a place uh, filled, as you can tell, with books and uh, magazines. In fact, we're going to be talking about a very special journal that's been around for a little bit of time, but it's also making waves because of the quality of the writing and uh, perhaps a model for sustainability, and that's something we're going to be talking about later. But at first, I'm going to talk to the founder and manager of the Tinta Budi Bookstore. He's also a founder, uh, a member of the Swara Journal. Uh, Nazir Harith Fazila, uh, welcome to my show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay, let's let's talk a little bit about the context of the bookstore. Chongsan Building is a kind of refurbished building and it has all these little spaces. Why did you decide that you wanted to set up a bookstore here? I mean, you and your collaborators. We, we first started in Ipoh, actually, in 2016. And then um, I was invited by uh, a friend who also is co-partner in uh, Tinta Budi Bookshop. So at that particular time, we are thinking of moving to KL, but we don't find any suitable places. First, because of the rental situation, which is expensive. Uh, and for a bookshop, it's hard to maintain that kind of um, cost. So when they approach us and then they told about the Zongshan building and they told about everything and we just decided, yeah, let's let's pack our bags and move to KL. Yeah, and this is very interesting because there's a, there's a question of the reading public, mm -hmm. the size of the reading public, and then to uh, the public that's willing to spend money on books. and. Um, I'm, uh, you know, intrigued by the Ipo origins of the bookstore. Mm. I mean, is there much of a uh, public in uh, Ipo and Pe larger Pera mm. for books of this sort? Because they're, first of all, they're, they're extraordinarily um, highbrow books mm. and they must be uh, reasonably expensive compared to uh, other books. So w was there a, a buying public in Ipo? Uh, in Ipo, they actually have one a couple of like um, used books, a bookshop like uh, Novel Heart and whatnot. Um, in 2016, when we first started, we get most of our buying from online. And when we look at all the addresses, most are in Kuala Lumpur and Selangor. Um, it's hard for us to get like uh, people who came to the shop and buy from the shop. So then we toy with the idea of like, maybe the market is not here at the moment. Um, and we have to keep on selling to sustain ourselves. So why not like try to find some place in, in KL, at least we can cater to that particular group of people, which is our customer also. Right, yeah. and has that proven to be the right decision coming here? Yes, uh, we have a lot more people coming to the shop. We have reached a lot more people uh, because it's when you're selling online, it's hard for you to reach out to more people. Although you think that you have an access to a whole lot of people but actually it's harder for you to, to reach out to them um, so for us it's much more efficient in the sense of brick and mortar because we talk to people people also um, suggesting to their friends who come to the shop uh, this sort of stuff and Zongshan building also house many different people who have different audience so there is a mix of audience that come to the shops also yeah and I think there's something about the experience of browsing of uh, that people who love books mm -hmm. uh, you know really enjoy the part of the the experience is not just you know buying the book i know you guys are on like instagram for mm -hmm. instance right and you can buy books there but you know uh, when i last bought a mm -hmm. book from you guys um it, i had the option of going online i decided no i'm going to come to the bookstore and have a look at the book as well and i think the feel is so much part of the experience could you help us understand uh, the relationship between Tinta Budi and the journal Suara? What, what is it? Was it an organic one? Did you feel that you needed a vehicle, your own uh, material coming out? How did you think through the, um, the, the idea of Suara? Um, Tinta Budi, I've been toying with the idea of publishing for quite a while because meeting with uh, a lot of people who are in the in publishing industry and I see that is a room for a certain kind of writing to be out there. Um, Tita Budi started publishing in 2019, so that one we basically translated um, Malay poetry, Happy Samsa poetry, into English that we launched in Georgetown Literary Festival. Uh, and then uh, meeting with Hafiz and also meeting with Badrul, who are um, 
who all of us are now in uh, in suara channel so we start up your suara channel so we talk with a lot of people we need something we need a periodical in bahasa melayu that talks about this thing seriously and with the right writing manner uh, let just put it that way was there a precursor were you modeling yourself in older journals that because this is long form mm. it's also uh, very pictures heavy and the design elements you know uh, i don't recognize it as being something that has a precursor but maybe i missed it i mean mm. is there something in the past that this was also modeling itself on i think when we first started the periodical we realized that we have a whole history of Malaysian periodicals that is available and that is uh, sold um, throughout the years. We have the Mastika during the 60s and 50s. We have a Masa, uh, which is recently. We have Siasa, uh, 90s, uh, 2000. And we have Dewan, uh, Majalah Dewan Masyarakat, which is in their high day in 1970s and 80s, which provide a lot of like good content materials with a good look of uh, the physical magazine. So bearing all those publication in mind, So we feel that nowadays we don't see that anywhere in the bookshop or in any new sense. Um, all focus more on celebrity or focus more on entertainment per se. And there is a couple of like good magazine also by day one, but their look is not as engaging with the new audiences. So we think that it's a high time for us to let's just do it. At least um, if we fail, we did this. Um, to prove that this works. <laughs> well, I hope you don't fail because <laughs> I, I, I think it, there is something to be said about the aesthetics of the of the journal, right? Mm. It's, um, and it does appeal. Uh, the, the question, of course, is: that Does it appeal to enough people? Mm. Will it, you know, um, uh, invite them to put down the twenty-five ringgit? I think that's mm. yes. that it costs, and which is like a latte and a half, mm. isn't it? Mm. I mean, you, when you think about it. People spend uh, ridiculous amounts of money on all kinds of things, mm. uh, avocado toast. Why not a journal, right, mm. which they can come back to again and again? Uh, lastly, I mean, to what extent has the journal helped uh, also popularize the bookstore and uh, and vice versa? And, and which, how does it work? Mm. Basically, when we sell the journal, we sell through online from directly from Journal Suara. And then Tintabuji is also one of the um, one of the distributor of the magazine. So people come to the shop and so buy the uh, the journal magazine. And we also sell it to a couple of like um, personal seller because they buy because it's harder for us to approach um, a business entity, uh, a bookshop or a newsstand because because of the terms, the the purchasing term. So we can't afford to have such a long time for them to reimburse whatever magazine that they take lah. So uh, we realize that and we need money fast at least to roll it uh, for the next issue. So that is one of our main concern. And most of our journal are being sold by private sellers, which is good because they engage more with the readership instead of like you put in the shop and then if someone come and buy, someone come and buy lah. But if someone don't come and it's harder for you to move it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for speaking to me. I'm going to be speaking next to Badrul Hisham Ismail. He's the content editor for Suara Magazine and also one of the founder members. Uh, we're here at the Tintabudi Bookstore in Kampung Atap uh, in the Chongsan Building. Stay tuned to Let's Talk. Hi and welcome back to Let's Talk. I'm here with Badrul Hisham Ismail. He's the content editor of Suara. That was the journal we were talking about uh, earlier that been sold here at the Tintabudi bookstore and also kind of bound up with it in very interesting ways. Uh, Badrul, um, your role as content editor, could you kind of describe it? Uh, what exactly does that mean? Why are you not just editor? <laughs> well, um, okay. Well, the role is one thing, but basically um, how we work is basically just the three of us uh, really plan out what will be the theme of each issue and what are the topics or the essays that we would be interested to look out for and who would be the one that we'd be interested to engage. 
Right, so this is uh, Hafiz Hamza, uh, uh, yes, Nazir uh, Fazila, and yourself, right? Yes, okay. correct, yeah. So basically, um, when we, every time we uh, are planning for the next issue, we would sit down together and would flesh out what we think would be the most appropriate uh, theme for the specific issue that we're going out at that specific time. Because we already know beforehand when, uh, because the way the journal is being sort of um, scheduled, the first right. quarter, it's a quarterly, quarter, right. yes. Mm -hmm. So we know which, which quarter uh, when is going to come out. So and we decided um, what would be the best thing to uh, talk about within that specific quarter. Is there something that is timely for that specific time, or it ha it doesn't have to be anything like that either. Yeah, I mean, I think it's for me. It struck me as extraordinarily brave to get into this because uh, many people dream of this. Uh, few try it. And many fail to keep it, you know, to sustain it. Really, really good uh, journals. I, I think I can think of like Sentap, uh, you know, uh, that that ran specifically on the visual arts. And maybe that was too narrow a focus. But yeah, help me understand. How do you make sense of your the concerns that you have personally or intellectually uh, with your, you know, co-editors, and what do you think an audience might want, and so on and so forth. How do you manage that? Well, well, first of all, we're still trying, so we hope to see, you know, uh, longer than the other ones, hopefully. Uh, but in terms of how we think about the content, uh, we, we start broad. Unfortunately, I'm not the kind of person who really knows what the audience think, so I don't even try to think that way. But I would just think about what would be the interesting stories that would be relevant to Malaysia now that can also talk about things in the past and touch upon what we might you know, want to talk about in the future. So we always start with something that is very broad, uh, that, which is why the journal is always just about um, contemporary issue, arts and culture, so we leave it broad. We only get it narrowed down when we talk about the specific themes of specific issues. Even then, it's still sort of a loose um, connection between each essay. They're only at attached thematically, they're not you know, really connected to each other in terms of the storyline. Um, so, for example, uh, earlier this year, the first issue of this year, the fifth issue, um, after one year of dealing with COVID, we thought about maybe the first of 21, we should be something that is more sort of, um, you, know, sp you know, lighten up the spirit, um, you know, see how we can deal with the future, brighten up the color a little bit, so we choose visually it is different from what we produced last year, and we thought, Maybe youth spirit is something that we can talk about. So that, that was the theme of the fifth issue, which was the January issue this year. Yeah, th and this was the issue I actually picked up because I, I know uh, Hafiz Hamza and I, and I knew of, of the journal, but you know, I, there was, in many ways, we, are so, we live in a time of so much distraction. There's so much to read, right? Why pick up yet another thing that you might not even read? And uh, I read it partly because of Rahmat Harun's essay on Avroko. Uh, who was a performance artist who died many years ago and who I knew personally. And so I, and I really liked the writing and it opened me up to the other uh, essays in the, in the journal. And I was, um, I think they attracted to it because I think we're always told, you know, martabat kan bahasa, you know, kebangsaan and all that. But actually the, the real charisma is in the writing as in making the language, I think, relevant through the stories you tell, right? And so your decision, because I know there's um, a translated work, uh, English to Malay, yes. in, the, in the journal. What do you make of this deciding to go wholly bahasa rather than maybe mixing it up and doing bilingual? Well, that was one of the earlier things that we discussed about uh, before we started up. This was back in 2019. Uh, are we going to have probably like 70% Malay content and then probably 30% English content. But then we realized that once we go that direction, the possibility of only getting English content and not getting the Malay content is going to be bigger. Uh, so we don't want to be in the future where we're going to get way too many English content but not enough Malay content because the truth is there are not enough Malay content out there. And that is, is it a writer issue? I mean, why, why not? You would think that in, a, in Malaysia, you know, Malay content would not be the, the difficult one. I think it's a combination of a few things uh, from the person who wants to start the journal. They would always think about commercial aspect. Um, there's a huge um, assumption that uh, Malay readers are not good consumers. 
they wouldn't buy these um, things, they would just you know, get things free online. Um, and then there's the issue of probably getting advertising, English content, probably you could get more, you know, bigger advertising uh, opportunities. So those probably one of the things, I mean, a combination of things why people decided to go more on English uh, medium when it comes to print. Uh, but of course, we not thinking very smartly. <laughs> uh, we just thought that you know maybe it's more commercially uh, valuable to do it that way. But our purpose is also something different. We want to be commercially viable, but at the same time, we want to serve something else. We want to serve something that is not available out there, and try to make sure that they, that would be sustainable for us. Yeah, I mean, in fact, even in the English language, and I'm not talking specifically about Malaysia, but in other countries where English language is a major uh, language for media, uh, long form uh, and you know, essays of this sort, cultural analysis and, uh, and commentary is actually very rare, it's becoming more and more difficult to find funding for these kinds of vehicles. Um, let's just make a quick switch to your upcoming issue, which I was very interested in. Mm -hmm which is about the natural cu natu uh, national cultural policy yes. uh, and there's a, the 50th anniversary I see coming up. Tell yes. us a little bit about what you want to put in there. So 2021 is the 50th anniversary of two major um, policies in, that, in Malaysia. Uh, one is the national economic policy and, one, and the other one is uh, the Dasar uh, Kebudayaan the national uh, cultural policy. Uh, so we thought that it's about time that we uh, sort of get some writing to revisit that, uh, to reflect on it, to see after 50 years, uh, are we going to the right direction? Were those decisions to have those policies a good decision? Could we uh, improve or was some mistake that we can learn from? So we decided that that would be the main, uh, the theme of, of, um, of the upcoming issue that we are uh, going to publish soon. Right, so that seems like a, bit, uh, a bit of a hot topic, right? Because, I mean, the NEP is debated endlessly uh, national cultural policy, not so much. It seems uh, there are only one or two um, Malaysians, I think, who do some serious research on that, Kathy Rowland being one of them who's, uh, who is associated with Arts Equator. She's one of the editors based in Singapore. Uh, but yeah, so what do you hope to, uh, because I'm trying to get you to promote this next yes. issue. <laughs> I mean, who's going to be writing for it and what kind of positions are you taking as a, or do you not take a position as a journal? As a journal, we try not to take a position in terms of which argument that we go into agree on. Uh, we just want to have different opinions so that people can look at all these different uh, views on the same issue. Um, so personally, we, we are not really taking any stand on uh, all the content that is out. Um, so for the upcoming one, we have quite a few you know, important figures that uh, contribute. Uh, we have Raiz Saniman, who is one of the drafters of the NEP. Uh, we have uh, Muhammad Khalid, uh, the economist, also writing about NEP. Uh, and then we have uh, Faizal Musa, or Faizal Tehrani, who he, he write about the uh, national cultural policy. Uh, and they all have very strong opinions about what those things are, how they came about and what are their impacts and how we should you know, um, move forward. Uh, right, is it going to be kind of dry analysis because once you mention an economist you know i think but of course um Imam khalid is the author of the color of inequality yes, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so but what about the stories because this last uh, issue was filled with really compelling stories yes i think that is one direction that is a bit different this issue because it is such a big national issue that it's difficult to personalize it in that sense uh, although the writers have very strong, you know, voice behind them that you can, you know, almost hear the way they speak through their writing, which is in a, you know, interesting for us to sort of explore that aspect of uh, personalization. But yes, it will it be less personal uh, compared to the uh, compared to the fifth issue. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, we'll be right back with more. I'm going to speak to Hafiz Samza, the other editor of Suara Magazine. Stay tuned to Let's Talk.
Welcome back to Let's Talk. I'm Sharad Kutin. With me, Hafiz Hamza. He's the chief editor of Swara magazine. And we're here at the Tintabudi bookstore in the Chongsan building in Kampong Atap. Uh, Hafiz, you're the third person I'm going to be speaking yes. to about the journal. Uh, perhaps we can shift more. I, I want to focus on the question of language and uh, a market for not just the language of a Malay uh, journal, but a Malay journal of opinion and essay. Uh, and uh, and so what is for you, have you learned over the last uh, year and a half, uh, your audience? Who's your audience? What do they want? And why is it that they, they want to read it in Bahasa? I think for me personally, because when you talk about Bahasa Melayu produce, apa, production in terms of penerbitan yang ada, for a long time, kita ada pendapat bahawa bahasa Melayu punya uh, penggunaan ataupun penerbitan tu selalu berada dekat grade yang rendah. Kalau as compared kalau English misalnya, itu kita sedar waktu kita mula suara, kita memang nak address benda ni. But having said that, kita tak adalah nak letakkan satu stand, apa satu cara Melayu yang keras, yang tinggi sampai orang tak faham. So I guess untuk saya sendiri, kenapa kita nak buat benda ni, kita nak orang rasa like, belong balik to the language itself. Bukan hanya orang Melayu, tapi kita as a Malaysia. Sebab guna bahasa Melayu, penggunaan dia untuk saya, saya tengok sangat bermasalah. Kalau saya boleh trace back, kalau a few years back, cara penggunaan atau orang consume bahasa Melayu ni dalam imagination orang, satu, oleh digunakan oleh politician dan dipick up oleh media massa dan itu yang dikonsum oleh ramai orang. Kedua, kalau lately dengan media sosial ni, budak-budak muda guna cara mereka gunakan bahasa Melayu, sangat yang kolokial lah, rendah apa semua. Tapi untuk kita, kita sedar gap ni dan kita nak fill in the gap. So ada bahasa Melayu, cara penggunaannya yang sangat apa sangat boleh distort, dipiuhkan dan boleh digunakan untuk satu hal yang lebih... Saya tak suka guna word serious ni tapi ah, itulah kegunaan yang lebih... Nak kata akademik tak, kita half akademik tapi kita like enjoy like to push the bahasa Melayu macam mana nak guna dia dalam cara yang paling imaginative lah I would say. Yeah, so that's very interesting because it actually is... Um uh, a challenge for me as an English reader, somebody who reads primarily English, uh, yet I could access it. So a, a piece about um, uh, Malaysian migrants in Australia, mm -hmm. the Swan Hill piece, is written very simply. It's yep. by a photojournalist, very yep. descriptive, n really no problems with that. Mm. Uh, Ramat Harun's work, uh, essay on Avroko, was much more literary. Yeah. His language, because I was constantly yeah. reaching for friends uh, <laughs> and saying, what does this mean, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, ada uh, kiasannya, ada dan maybe words that you don't normally uh, encounter in ordinary speech. Uh, How do you make that balance be between? Because it's very attractive. I mean, it's one of the attractive things I think about the journal. I think kalau you sendiri pun bila baca dan you ada rasa keperluan untuk tengok, to look up for the words, I think kita partly dah achieve what we are trying to do lah. Because I think untuk uh, bahasa Melayu diterima balik, kita nak break all the barriers tu lah. Sebab tu dalam suara, kita tak hanya tumpukan semua yang agak uh, bahasa yang agak stiff essay yang mostly panjang tapi tak adalah yang keras sangat. Semua yang I would say kita letak satu style yang kita rasa orang paling tidak pun orang nak. Bila, kalau pun dia tak faham tapi dia still can go beyond that. Dia tak dia bukan macam eh the whole essay oh, tak faham lah apa dia cakap. No. Cara lenggok dia, cara words yang kita pakai, cara kita edit the whole thing untuk jadi interesting narrative wise ah itu yang kita rasa yang kekuatan yang mengikat keseluruhan tu like you said uh, all this one hill apa semua is the cerita dia lah narrative kan so that's we realize itu kita nak gunakan sebagai pillar and then the rest kita nak try to experiment and push the boundaries lah right so what is tell us a bit about the mix of uh, formats within yeah. the the journal because uh, there are essays i think there was a the last issue opened with a short story. Actually, I wasn't quite sure whether it was a short story or, or it was a memoir, mm. but uh, tell us about that. I mean, between literary fiction mm. and then the more di reportage, journalistic yeah. work. I think, again, for me, that's to show how, apa, kepelbagaian lah, cara nak gunakan bahasa Melayu. So, saya tak rasa dia hanya sesuai untuk sastra. So, basically, biasa orang cakap bahasa Melayu is sastra yang sangat keras, sangat tertutup, sangat terpencil. Now, dengan suara tak, kita nak pakai bahasa Melayu, Melayu tapi kita nak address benda yang lain. Benda yang lebih besar, benda yang lebih menarik lah idea ataupun sejarah kita as a whole lah. Dan kita nak bawa, uh, kita nak orang rasa, ramai orang rasa yang, eh, kita part of this lah. Melalui bahasa Melayu. Kita tak nak bahasa Melayu hanya 
ter apa tersekat ataupun ter, terpencil hanya untuk orang yang Melayu. Sebab kita terlampau divided in a way kan. Termasuk dalam imagination kita pun. So it, for me that's problematic lah. Dengan cara kita dikotak-kotakkan hidup dalam sosial, uh, society sekarang. So now we bahasa Melayu kita nak pecahkan tu nak fluidkan dia. Okay, tell us a little bit about the reception. Eh? Have you gotten yeah. feedback from your readers and apa yang mereka kata? Uh, early on, I think yes, banyak sebenarnya. Banyak orang concern tentang bahasa, tentang tata bahasa, tentang apa semua. But to me, it is a good thing sebab satu hal je lah. Tak kisah dia kritik atau dia suka. Uh, it shows that oh betul-betul orang pay attention. At least people are pay attention. Walaupun dengan cara kita bergerak yang kecil, kita tak ada modal apa semua, tu. To us, that's really meaningful lah. So, Dewan Bahasa and Pustaka is calling you saying, uh, why do you use the language like this? Or? Tak ada call macam tu, but I think there are few uh, apa situation yang kita dipanggil meeting apa semua. Bukan untuk marah ke apa. Just like, I think dia awal pun tengok siapa orang ni yang buat benda-benda ni kan. So, kita nak kenal dia. Kenapa dia out of nowhere, siapa-siapa yang tak kenal tapi kita manage to put up things like this and consistent. Itu paling, I think yang penting suara buat is ada consistency itulah. Yeah. So, okay. In, in the upcoming uh, issue yes. or your latest issue, um, you do you have anything about uh, in in literary formats that reflect the NEP or the Dasar Kebudayaan Nasional? If you are talking about short stories or apa literature yang on that subject, no. But I think we always uh, write on the idea or to revisit benda-benda yang kita rasa penting lah. So, and this upcoming issues memang I think sedikit, uh, I would say sedikit berat in the sense of subject dia sebab mungkin bukan semua orang suka and the EB and also dasar kebudayaan. Tapi for suara, kita rasa now, especially now, with, with whole, this whole thing kan, political apa semua ni, is a important time for us to reflect and at least to really understand apa yang dah jadi 50 tahun lepas and to tengok kita kat mana sekarang and penting lah untuk set the cost for another 50 years maybe but dia bukan nak set apa-apa for us kita nak cucuk biar orang bercakap dan bincang balik kalau yang belum pernah dengar dasar kebudayaan apa ni vis ah nah baca at least this to start with and then you have all other reading, readings to to explore lah thank you so much Hafiz for being with me thank you okay so that's that concludes this show I've been speaking to Badrul Hisham Ismail uh, just Hafiz Hamza and Nazir Harit Fadila at the Tindabudi bookstore here in the Chongsan building at Kampong Atap. That's all I have for you this week of uh, Let's Talk only on Astro One News.